Hey, and welcome back to Game Talk. I'm your host, Damon Beyond. Today, I'm joined by Connor. Hey, guys. And Mike. Hello. And today, our main topic is game length. Now, I think game length is an interesting thing to discuss because, you know, like pacing and length, like with any form of media, like really impacts personally my enjoyment of it. And like the the thing with games is they're interactive, right? So no one's going to have like spend the same amount of time on a single game, right? Like you just have a sort of like vague average of how long it takes most people to beat a game. Yeah, I do. Um, How long to beat dot com. I check a lot. Of yeah, it. that's a great site. But it also just is not super accurate for me too like it's been four or five hours off on games that are as short as like 20 hours before yeah i mean where do you guys kind of trend i actually tend to i think play games for longer than the average not by much but by a little bit i I think it's i I almost always finish them faster than other people because i don't i do not even humor side content a lot of the time lately especially since game pass like even when I'm really enjoying a game, like I really loved Final Fantasy 15, for example, a hot take maybe, but I didn't play any side quests in that game. I just beelined it straight for the end. And I don't yeah. think I to do that. Yeah, I definitely, I think I'm the opposite. I tried to do, I'm kind of a completionist. Like I tried to do all the things because I have it in my mind that I want to see everything this game to ho- offer or at least until I get like to the point where I'm like, okay, I, ne- I need to move on. But in general... That's the philosophy I take. Now, with games like, let's say, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I can't really do that, right? Mm -mm. But like... I mean, Assassin's Creed games, I feel like you just kind of do some side quests as you go along. And that's like the intended play style. Is every once in a while you take a break, do some side stuff. Yeah, because like... I'm really bad though. Like, that throws off the pacing so bad for me because I feel like a lot of main storylines have some element of urgency to them. And I am not capable of just suspending that and going and doing other stuff anymore. Like, if I am at all immersed in your game, then it is wild to me to think about tearing myself away from the main story to go do anything else. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. Like, if the story dictates, like, something should happen with urgency, then I totally follow that. I think one thing that comes to mind is Spider-Man, you know, like, 20, the new one or whatever. Um, there was a point in the game where, like, near the end, like, the city's basically falling apart, and, like, you're basically just left to confront the final villain, but you're able to, like, swing around and still do side stuff, and I was just like, there's no way. <clears throat> and, yeah, I think, uh, I, I always adhere to, like, these story beats over that my preference to explore, because I think that improves my immersion, but... This is an absolute aside, and this doesn't really affect Spider-Man so much, but games that have side quests and stuff... Uh, that like once you beat the game they just toss you back into the game but right before you beat the final boss that is a huge pet peeve for me I hate like that the world is still falling apart and that's the that's the open world that I have to finish up the side quests in yeah no I I, I agree with you 100% a lot of games the most egregious I can think of is Ocarina of Time that does that yeah but I, I, I do want to say there are a lot of games nowadays that organically have like a post game, right? Like, so the world is still available for you to explore and do stuff after you beat the main game in an organic way. And the main thing that comes to mind for me is 2018's God of War, right? Like, after you beat that game, you know, like, it's very obvious that like, okay, like the state of the world has changed, like huge ramifications for what you guys did, but you can still explore the world, still get new dialogue based yeah. off like what you did at the end of the game and etc yeah psychonauts 2 uh we'll, we'll talk about more later but it actually once you beat the game uh, a location of a lot of the npcs change the way they refer to you changes and uh a lot of just character context changes but all the, like they changed i didn't do any side quests until after i beat that game and they the dialogue when I completed the side quests accounted for the fact that I had already beat the main game. Like they, I totally love that wrote extra dialogue to change the context of them. And yeah, I, I love, really cool. I love it when games go the extra mile to do stuff like that. Yeah, to include dialogue that maybe one in a thousand people will hear. You know, like it just. But you know, like I think Breath of the Wild does a similar similar thing with its dialogue. It's very context sensitive and stuff like that. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, in general, like. I guess uh, to kick things off, what are your all's preferred game length if you have one? Mine has changed a ton, but like 
I like a tight eight to eight to twenty hour game, depending on. Yeah, I hate fluff. Like when I was playing Subnautica, I liked that game, and it was ruined by how long it was to me. Like that game would have been an amazing eight hour game, but instead they stretched it out to like twenty five or thirty hours, and that ruined it for me. I, uh, but but I've totally changed because when I was a kid, I, I was one of those dollar to hour type people, you know. And I, uh, it was hard for me to justify an Uncharted game when a Skyrim cost the same amount and lasted me hundreds of hours. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people when they're maybe first getting into the into games have that mentality, but like you very quickly learn that uh, qu- quantity does not equal quality, right? See, for me, it was very much a financial situation change because uh, when I That's when true. I was young, I was broke and I needed to get as many hours of entertainment out of a game as possible because either way, I was going to be stuck with this game and not getting any others. So you know, That's getting fair. a ton of time out of it mattered to me so like skyrim terraria minecraft anything multiplayer those were my go-tos whereas now i'm an adult and i'm in a situation where i kind of have at least as far as gaming i have more money than time so i like the tight experiences where like every hour is phenomenal and the cost of the game is not as much a factor for me See, I'm kind of in the same range. I would say 12 to 20 hours is my preferred length, right? And, like, I do have a soft spot spot in my heart for, like, the giant, massive open worlds that just go on endlessly, just in as a virtue of the fact that, like, a world exists that that's, you know, that massive and that immersive. Like, I still appreciate that fact, but my preferred, you know... And it's always been that way. Like, I've always preferred, like, the Uncharted's to, like... Yeah. something like you know fallout or something like that yeah and th- those games like they have to be something special to be that to me and like breath yes. of the wild was like but that's been the only real massive open world game i've played to completion like i've i've dabbled in a few others like i i played assassin's creed valhalla a little bit but i got like a month of ubi play plus or whatever and played that when the month ran out i had no intention of going back and like i played gta online for a bit had some fun don't really care to return to it. Goof around in No Man's Sky. Yeah, once I hit about 60 hours in one of the longer form games, I just start to lose attention. Yeah. Like, it, it starts to drift so away. good games to play, you know? Yeah, I, yeah. It's like I don't have the time anymore or the attention span to spend yeah, 100 no, plus hours on the game. games that are, like, super high skill ceiling, like, like Noita, I fell into hard and dropped, like, 150 hours in. I mean, I can put 150 hours into a multiplayer game now because at least yeah, there's the something to grab me. Yeah. But like the wi- I still haven't finished The Witcher Three. Yeah, still yeah. still not there. I'm 73 hours in. I finished <laughs> Control before I finished The Witcher Three. Right, Control Control really hits the sweet spot for me lengthwise. I thought that game was immaculately paced. Yeah, it's I, like what 20 ish hours, 30 hours, 20, maybe? 16 yeah, 20 to for the base game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think about base game. Yeah, uh, sixteen DLC, yeah, base game was very nice as well, though. I also some of my favorite games of all time, though, like the one the one I'm thinking of right now is uh, I really like a movie or uh, I, I call them like a movie game almost when I'm describing them to my friends, and that's because they're they're an experience that we could reasonably sit down and play through in an evening together. Yeah, like the Beginner's Guide, which is like regardless of skill level probably an hour and a half to two hours and uh that game was like twenty dollars or something so like if you're running the dollar to play time ratio that game's terrible but it's one of my favorite games of all time anyway the the tight two hour experiences there are a few others that are like that a couple of like smaller indie games like anatomy i just want to chime in i think uh journey is one of my favorite games ever and it's like an hour and a half max you know like if you try to drag it out so. And, I, and I love those games, and they're really cool. I wouldn't recommend them to people in high school with no income, probably, because I I would not have been super happy about them when I was at that point in my life, probably. Yeah. But it, and and they're typically cheaper. Like it's pretty rare that you're paying sixty dollars for an hour and a half game, unless you're buying Sonic Forces. Oh, that was forty. But um, the the reason I bring this up, actually, the the entire reason I suggested this topic was because I saw an indie game studio go under 
And uh, it had actually done decent numbers on Steam, but the game was only an hour and a half long. And like I, the, on Twitter, the developers were saying that something like half of the people that played it, played it, finished it, and refunded it. Oh, that sucks. Because Steam has a universal blanket. Uh, two, uh, if you've played under two hours, you can return the game policy, which I think is atrocious because that's super helpful to like mega games like you can play an assassin's creed game for two hours and not know whether or not you like it and then you can play an indie game for an hour and finish it and have had a great time and then return it yeah that sort of that rule that system is not really fair across the board right like you said like triple a games are you know probably won't affect them much at all but like indie games really get hurt by something like this i mean i've played games that have severe technical issues that i've spent over an hour maybe a little more just trying to see if I could get the game to work. And like, that's not fun. Cause that mean that cuts into my two hours to decide whether or not I like it. But then, yeah, you know, there are indie games like, like Proteus, for example, I, I like kind of, but if I, you know, I got that in a humble bundle, I think, but had I bought it on steam, you can kind of experience everything Proteus has to offer in 45 minutes. Yeah. This is Proteus, the weird atmospheric Island traveling game. Yeah. Not, I'm aware. Not Proteus. The, uh, the first person shooter, that is an early access on Game Pass now, which is also I've, quite good. I've got Proteus on Vita, the the first one. Yeah, oh, that's probably a fun way to play that game. So, two questions for you guys. Have you ever played through a game and thought, that's too short? I don't know if I have, now that I think about it. Yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, I that have. Kind of a funny... Uh, when I was developing Perspectrum, I thought that constantly. <laughs> you know, me and my... Fr- like, I... Because I, as the developer, it was very difficult for me to gauge how long Perspectrum was and uh, to, to figure out how long it would be for an average player. And then also, like, because, you know, to, it was long enough that it was very difficult to get someone I know to sit down and play it through start to finish without paying them, while also being, you know, short enough that it did not feel long enough when I would play it really quickly by myself. Yeah, but your perspective's like, one, you, you're like the only one with that perspective in the world, right? You made the game, so like it's right, not it, a fair assessment from you. What I'm saying is there are a lot of people developing games that probably feel this way about their game. Like game like this, something developers struggle with, I'm sure, because I did. Yeah. I don't know, like, aside from the whole indie trouble of like making your game long enough so it gets past like the Steam refund window, I think you just need to be organic about it. Like I think if you try to artificially lengthen or shorten your game, it can only hurt it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I'm trying to think. The the game coming to mind right now that I thought was too short as a kid was the Iron Man game I bought for the Wii. God, we've and, talked uh, about that game every week for several was, weeks now. It was, yeah, I don't know why it keeps coming up, but I did enjoy that game, but it was only like two hours long. And I, I would have like putting more levels in was all I would have wanted as a kid. I would have played them. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm racking my brains right now and I feel like on the short end of the spectrum, I can't really think of much. Can you, Mike? Uh, I know Katana Zero is lo- way too short for how good the game is. <laughs> my problem with yeah, my problem with stuff like that is that I would rather a game leave me wanting than um, go on for too long. Like when Axiom Verge Two ended, I played this last week, and I'm going to talk about it later. When it ended, I thought the ending was kind of abrupt, and I I definitely was not like ready for it. I wanted to play more. But I would vastly prefer that to the game having stretched on for like 40 hours in me or, or any padding at all. This game was pretty tight. No padding. Yeah. Anything they could have done to make this game longer, I probably would not have liked. Yeah, Katana yeah. Zero is only four hours long. That's pretty short. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I, I, there's, uh, there is a DLC coming at some point. And I, I, I'm sure we've all been in the place where like we're enjoying a game so much we don't want it to end. But, like, I feel like that's a different conversation of, like, a game was actually too short and it actually was detrimental to it, you know? Because, like, even for longer games, like, I remember when I first played 2018's God of War, I was, like, so obsessed with it and I was terrified of the fact that I would beat it because I didn't know how long it was, right? And I just kept playing and playing and playing. And even when I got past, like, the 20-hour mark, I was like, please don't end, please don't end, just because I was so enamored with the game. Yeah, I I really think it's more a matter... When, when a game, when I find myself more frustrated is when a game's pacing is bad. 
than when it's not long enough. Like, it's more like you should have told me that this was ending uh, subtly, not like literally one of those messages like Zelda will do where it's like, you, you should save, you're about to fight the final boss. But like, it, it, like <laughs> you learn the witch's hat when you're learning about writing in elementary school. And I find that sometimes games don't do a good job of like falling action after their climax, you know? You, yeah, you that's definitely. And the game ends. Yeah, that's definitely, I think that might be one of the hardest things, at least from like a, like a game experience perspective, pacing, right? Like pacing, pacing is hard. <laughs> like it's. Yeah, especially in games that give you so many choices, you know, it pacing's not so bad in a, in an uncharted game, for instance, because it's a linear experience. But if, if you can go off the rails even a little bit, then you're just inviting the, the player to ruin your pacing and there's not yeah. much you can do about it. Yeah. What I will say though, is I think, uh, in the P- uh, PlayStation four generation, I think Sony's gotten really good at making exclusives that have proper pacing for both. If you want to just mainline the story and if you want to do side quests, cause like both horizon zero dawn and God of war, I think if you just follow the main story, it's a 20 to 25 hour game. But if you decide to do everything, they're both 40 hour games. And I think either way you play those, it's it. I don't think the pacing suffers, which yeah. I think is very impressive. I, I just think that the industry has gotten better at doing side content uh, as a whole in the past like 10 years, because I carry a lot of baggage from when I was a kid from like obvious padding and like the side quests are just there so that they can say the game was longer. Yeah, a lot less, a lot less less like, yeah, I don't want to be, you know, throw shade here, but a lot less like MMO level side quests, you know, where it's like collect 20 of these and like, yeah, a lot less, yeah, a lot more. Although even, even some MMOs have gotten rid of a lot of the, the pet, the side quest padding. uh, I mean, the fact that MMOs have cutscenes now is insane to me because I grew up playing Maple (laughs) Story. Dude, Maple Story has cutscenes now. I know. I I'm not super fond of that, but I yeah, I was watching some stuff about Final Fantasy 14 recently because I've had I've had Mike talking about it. Griffin McElroy was talking about it on the Besties uh, podcast, and uh, a YouTuber I watched put out a video. Uh, King K, I believe, put out a video about it recently. And with all that, I was looking at Final Fantasy 14 a bunch, and that game looks like it's paced like a single player RPG almost. Yes, like, with cutscenes and it yeah. very much is paced like an RPG. Dude, yeah. if I'm so afraid of Final Fantasy XIV because I feel like I would absolutely love it and then just get sucked into it and not do anything else. So, yeah. I don't yeah, know, man. MMOs are another thing where if i running out of content in an MMO, I, I want to have a certain number of hours of original content from an MMO. And I, I stand by my... Uh, like, I, I should be playing an MMO for like... Uh, something like a hundred hours and still have original content in my mind. I think that's pretty fair, honestly. And I think with like the big ones, like wow. And final fantasy, yeah, that's like they, easily the case, you know? Yeah. And destiny. I, I I've been playing destiny some recently and that is, that is an MMO. Like I, I see the arguments that it's a games as a service, but that game is structurally just an MMO and you can't convince me otherwise. Yeah. I, yeah, Destiny is definitely like an MMO. I don't think it's as hardcore of an MMO as like WoW or Final Fantasy XIV. No. Maybe more MMO light, but like, but I don't know if there's like a hundred hours of like actual like story content in Destiny. Certainly, there's a hundred hours of like content content. Like you can do stuff for a hundred hours, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean like content content. Curated. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I. I don't know. I just think. Uh... I, I see this meme posted around a lot that is like, I want shorter games made by more people with worse graphics and the developers are paid more. And I'm not kidding. And I definitely agree with that. Yeah. So I guess on the opposite end of things, like, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, like how, when, when, when you feel like a game has gone on for too long and I, I'll, I'll kick things off. Like one of my favorite games Persona 5 is just too long. It is a little on the, Yeah, I, I, the idea of playing Persona 5 Royal, like, I get that it adds some cool stuff. It came, I would, out, it came out as I hit, like, the 40-hour mark in my Persona 5 playthrough, and I was just like, there's no way I will ever play this. Persona 5, I would argue, I, I love Persona 5. I think it's a 9 out of 10 experience. If you cut 20 hours off of Persona 5, it would be a 10 out of 10 experience, I think. 
Yeah, it is a long game. It is. I remember distinctly, like near the end of the game, or what I thought was the end of the game. I was just like, okay, let's speed things up here. And yeah, then I mean, literally I, twenty hours later, I was still playing. I was like, okay, this is yeah. a bit much. No, I mean Persona Five is a game that I can say I've enjoyed every moment of that I've played. That, that there's a decent chance I will never finish it because it is just so long. Like, well, I know that every time I sit down to play it, it's such a huge commitment, and I just don't have it in me it's so long and like it's and not, even longer <laughs> yeah it's not a game that is conducive to like playing a little bit at a time really in my opinion at least not not when you're in the dungeon sections of it yeah i when i played in persona i inhaled it i like yeah. did nothing else for that hundred hours you know yeah so yeah. it's like <laughs> if i I can't sit down and play it for a bit and then like my friends call and want to play Apex Legends or somebody wants to go out and do something, God forbid, while we still can. And, uh, you know, it. I just can't jump into Persona during those times. And yeah. I will say, though, Persona 4 Golden, on the other hand, is immaculately paced. Really? Okay. I, I, I think Persona 4 Golden, yeah, it's like 80 hours, but like it's perfectly paced, I think. You also played it portably, though, didn't you? Yeah, I did. So that might have something to do with its pacing being better. A portable game that you can sleep your console at any time and then pick back up immediately adds some. Well, I mean, I don't know if that argument really holds water today. You can do the same thing with PS5s and Xbox Series X, PS4 even. Like, you can put it to sleep and then wake back up and, like, I guess pick up right where you left off, you know? So it doesn't bother me as much on a port like the fact that my Nintendo Switch is locked into a game for like weeks at a time and I don't take that cartridge out doesn't bother me as much as like the idea of doing that with my PS4. And now you that's, have like a up with the PS5 where you can, you know, save state essentially. Yeah, I'm going to put out like a hot take. I think Red Dead 2 was way too long for its own good. I haven't played it. You know, Red Dead 2, I don't know if I agree with you there. Red Dead 2, the story was so good. I was engrossed the entire way through, but I can definitely see the argument. Yeah, it's it's one of those games that it it's kind of, I hate to say it, but it's kind of up its own ass. And in yeah. terms of the way it's structured. Rockstar also has a tendency to not be great at pacing. Like, yeah. I felt like when I played GTA five, it's been a long time since I played it granted. So, and I, I played it before I was really looking at games particularly critically, but I remember it just kind of ending on a whimper. Like you just played the game a bunch, did a bunch of cool stuff. And then suddenly, you know, it ended like just, just you over, had to yeah. make a call about what to do. And then the game was over. Yeah. I mean, I can't comp- comment on GTA because I've never been into GTA. Like I've tried several times and, Oh, GTA Five is the only one I've played. Yeah, so, yeah. But but GTA Red Dead Three also had those issues. I, I will say that I think Red Dead One had immaculate pacing. I I can understand the argument that Red Dead Two got a little long in the tooth, but I personally yeah. enjoyed it. There's just too much going on at one time, and my ADHD brain's like, "Ooh, do this, do this," and I never really got engrossed in the story because it'd be interrupted by bouts of going fishing. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I will say. I guess a slide t- tangent here. Along with Breath of the Wild, Red Dead Redemption 2 has the most impressive open world ever made, I think. It's just so living and breathing. Like, it feels so alive. And that definitely contributes to the length of the game. You I know, the game was way too long and could have could have probably been cut in half. Is Skyward Sword. <laughs> Dude, you know what? You know, I've been, I was playing it for the yeah. last several episodes. I have not touched it in weeks now. <laughs> Yeah, it's I've I just, powered through it in a single weekend, so I feel extremely qualified to tell you that that game is too long. Yeah, and usually I feel like Zelda games are usually pretty well, like well paced, extraordinarily well paced. Yeah, but like, but Skyward Sword, yeah, like I at this point, like I with the don't, exception of a uh, Wind Waker being the the Triforce Hunt in the original Wind Waker. Yeah, and well, I think that was yeah, I agree. But I think that was a product was like uh, unfinished content, right? It was, yeah, but it did ruin the pace of the entire game. Yeah, and I think that got rectified a bit in the Wii U version, right? Yeah, they uh, they stopped giving you the charts, and instead, a lot of the treasure chests just gave you a Triforce shard instead mm-hmm. of giving you a chart where you had to go hunt down the shard afterwards. Yeah, which is smart. It, that just immediately made it way better, and it's insane that they ever didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I feel like it's hard, like, we're talking about Zelda now, like, is it, I feel like it's harder to mess up 
pacing on a platformer. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, because there's, I mean, depends on how pure the platformer is. If we're talking like a Mario game, there's no. Yeah, I was thinking Mario more like because it's like it's not. There's, there's no, no story. story. Like, yeah, I'm not story, invested in a Mario game. I'm story just, definitely contributes heavily to pacing. Like the entire the entire pacing is the difficulty curve, and Mario, a lot of the newer Mario games don't have a difficulty curve, frankly, until the post yeah. game. Like it's just you know not very hard, and then you beat it. Uh, with the exception of like the post game of 3D World, and like. I guess some of the moons in Odyssey weren't easy per se, but none of them were very hard. I, I do like the concept you kind of brought up of like story pacing and gameplay pacing. Like I think Sekiro has some of the best gameplay pacing I've ever played, right? And it like all climaxes with the hardest boss fight of that game that just puts all of your skills to the test. So yeah. from a gameplay perspective, it's paced immaculately. Of course, like the story of Sekiro is kind of nonsensical, but it's not really a factor there. Because the gameplay really shines in that game. Yeah. I, uh... God, I can't think of a lot of games to talk about gameplay pacing with. Because a lot of the games I play for a long time are roguelikes, and, like... They're inherently designed to have, like, perfect pacing, right? Because each one is, like, death all really hard, and you just get a little farther every time. Yeah. Like, the pacing is built into the game. Exactly, yeah. And that's going to work for some people, and it's absolutely not going to work for others because i know a lot of people that just like can't stand losing progress in a game and that's you know that's just a fixed part of them and you can't do much about it and it it hurts me because i love roguelikes but i do personally want to give a shout out to to naughty dog i do think they're extremely good I, i think they're masters at pacing i know a lot of people would disagree with me uh, and name Uncharted 4. I know Uncharted 4 gets a lot of flack for being long, but I th- I'm i one of the ones who think Uncharted 4 was perfectly paced, and I really like the slower pace of Uncharted 4. I don't remember thinking Uncharted 4 was paced poorly, but I also remember it a lot less than any other Uncharted game. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's a lot more low-key, right? Like, Uncharted 2 and 3 had, like, insane set pieces. Some of the best in gaming to this day, I would argue. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, Uncharted 4 was a lot more slow and story-based and more of a slow burn, and I think people wanted the high-octane action of the first couple, or the first three games, and kind of were disappointed in that. Um, I, I definitely wasn't disappointed when I played it. I enjoyed every moment of Uncharted 4. I just, it doesn't have as many memorable moments. Like, the one I think of is the one that was in all the trailers, the one where you're, like, getting dragged behind a jeep and, like, the tank. and Yeah. yeah. I also think The Last of Us 1 is a perfectly paced game. I think, you know, the the climaxes and the slow moments are, like, placed in the perfect places in that game. I can say similar things about The Last of Us Part Two. I think it, it is twice as long as The Last of Us, but it does a different thing to you where, like, you get through, you're, you're like, you know, halfway or two-thirds of the way through it, and you kind of want it to end, but not because it's bad or anything. But for me, I kind of wanted to get to the end just because, like, it, it hurt me so bad. Yeah. Uh, and I was just in so much pain. I was just like, and to that game's credit, I don't think any game's ever done something like that to me before, uh, which I think speaks to the testament of like, you know, the story in that game. But yeah, I, I in general, I think Naughty Dog. Yeah, go ahead. Story wise, I agree with you on Last of Us Part One. I, I don't know if I agree with gameplay because I uh, I actually thought the hardest part of The Last of Us Part One was like sandwiched in the middle. And it was like, I will. Uh, so I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. What I will say for g- gameplay pacing for the last of us games, both part one and two, the last of us really sings at higher difficulty levels. I don't know if you played it on hard or above. I think but, I started over and played it on hard after finishing it on normal, but I don't think I finished it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think hard is where those games really shine gameplay wise. And I would prefer hard to be the normal difficulty level, but like, obviously that's not going to happen. And, you know, in general, I feel like for most games that I play, I think hard difficulty really, I don't know if it improves the gameplay pacing, but it definitely improves the experience. Like another one that comes to mind is Jedi Fallen Order. Like I played that on hard and it felt kind of like a Dark Souls game. And I really enjoyed that gameplay wise. Yeah. Yeah. So I I mentioned like Persona 5 as being too long. Do you guys have 
Any... Oh, oh my god, Digimon. Digimon World Dusk on the Nintendo DS. The, the moment you mentioned Persona, that came to my mind. because it's, <laughs> it's another typical kind of JRPG type deal. And it just... It's so long, and you have to grind. And it's like... It plays like a Pokemon game. But it's like... If a Pokemon game, like a Pokemon game, I think I think Pokemon games, like the main story wise, they're they're pretty well paced. I you've heard me complain about the lack of post game because I think there's a lot of room for creativity in a Pokemon game, and without a good post game, you don't actually get to really do it without just replaying the game. No, they realize people don't play the post game, so they got rid of the post game. Yeah, there. I mean, em- Emerald has one of the best post games in yeah. any game. Like, yeah. I agree. Emerald is fantastic. Emerald, Heart, Gold, and Soul, Silver. Uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, I think that the Pokemon games are immaculately paced for the for like opening through. Well, not all of them, but by and large, I think they're pretty well paced from like opening moments through to a uh, conclusion, beating the Elite Four and all. And then after that, it kind of goes off the rails. But you're allowed once you roll credits. I'm not really grading you on this anymore. But. Digimon World Dusk is like a 200 hour Pokemon game, basically. Like, I just could not do it. And I was a kid trying to play this thing. Yeah, and there was that's... no way. I, I don't even. And like, at no point playing the game did I have a concept of how close I was to the end because the structure was kind of loose and stuff. So, like, I played this game over 100 hours, I'm pretty sure. And I do not know if I was even halfway through it. Like, <laughs> it's wild to me that a Digimon game would be like this. It just went on and on and on. <laughs> just and and that's a common problem. I've looked I've looked it up, and that's a pretty common thing for Digimon games. They just go on forever. I don't think the newer ones, which take a lot of inspiration from Persona, I don't think they're like that. But like the DS era Pokemon or uh, DS era Digimon games were just endless. I don't yeah. know anybody who finished them. <laughs> and I do think like I think as I've gotten older, like I'm more okay with just leaving games that are longer and just never coming back to them. Like. I plan on coming back to Skyward Sword, but I don't know if I will, if I'm being real with you, you know, like, but, and like, I've done that, like, for a lot of games, unless I'm like, super, super into a game, like, there's no guarantee nowadays that I'll beat it. And like, yeah, to my kid self, that would have been blasphemous, you know? Yeah, the one that's really killing me right now is that I know that I've got like, a lot of Destiny 2 ahead of me, if I want to get to a raid, and I really want to play a raid in Destiny 2. And I'm really trying to chew that over, you know, yeah, mull it over, chew on it, see if I can get the uh, get the gumption to grind out. The, the good thing about Destiny 2 is that, like, you can play it however you want, and then you'll eventually get to a high enough level to do what you want to do. So, like, if you're into PvE only, you can do, like, you know, PvE missions on planets and stuff and do strikes and stuff. If you're yeah. really into PvP, you can only play PvP and then level it up enough for a raid you could level up in pvp i've only oh, been yeah. doing pve you can level I, I up in pvp in you get loot in pvp you can do everything in pvp that you do in pve loot wise and do either which kind of sucks because what's my that are playing on game pass so they have all of it oh yeah the expansions yeah and uh, there's also gambit you can level up through gambit and gambit is like a ton of fun from what i remember you know their pve vp mode might have to look at that but yeah i uh just diving into a long game is really with, with a few exceptions it's a lot for me to dive into a long game these days i i agree with you like there are certain games like i know like regardless of how long they are i will be all in on like the horizon forbidden west pre-orders went live the other day and like i was like click like i didn't have to think about that like that game i will be all over day one but yeah, like when breath of the wild 2 comes out I will, oh same yeah yeah like uh, i will likely buy the next like Elder Scrolls game realistically and play a lot of it. I will not finish it. I doubt, you know, I might finish the main yeah. story, but you know, I don't even know what to say to finish an Elder Scrolls game. I don't know what I meant there, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I guess beat the main story, but like, that's like, I never beat the, main of the content. Maybe I played Oblivion for like 70 hours and never beat the main story. Oh, I that's like, wandered off. Jesus. That's like, <laughs> I mean, no I, time at all on Oblivion. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like more people have not beaten the story in Elder Scroll games, like by a lot, than people who have beaten the story. You, you know, like it's yeah, yeah, yeah. And Elder Scrolls games have a fun thing where they try to do automated pacing, essentially, and it. I don't like it. I don't really like the uh, the fact that I can't like go back to an area and like 
crush everything in it because I, I like that feeling of progress in a game. But at the same yeah. time, it does let you just wander off and come back to the story, and the story is still going to feel right to you when you come back to it. Yeah, because like the the story in Skyrim, if I remember right, has zero urgency, right? Like it's yeah, like it's pretty low urgency, yeah. And, and it has to be that way, right? Like <laughs> by virtue of what Skyrim is, you know. Yeah, there's like uh, an apocalypse coming, but like at some point, <laughs> coming yeah. as in like before you die, probably. Like it's not <laughs> impending. You, you still have time to like do your errands and then get back to it, you know. Yeah, it's funny. No, the the Civil War ironically feels a lot more urgent than the main story does. Oh, I forgot about that, dude. It's been so long since I've played Skyrim. Like, really? I've had some friends replaying it recently, and uh, Gus Johnson's been playing it on Twitch a little bit. So I've like through osmosis experienced Skyrim a lot recently. And they are releasing the next gen updates for Skyrim. So whatever, <laughs> whatever, right? Oh, yeah, whatever. He can't. At this point, just Todd Howard stop. He, he, I can't believe we didn't talk about this last episode. He just can't. Why is he getting away with this? He just needs to make Elder Scrolls Six. Oh, like, you like, know, come on. paced immaculately, and like is the perfect length as all of the Devil May Cry games, uh, other than two. Maybe I didn't play that one. Oh, I need to check those out, dude. Yeah, they're they're paced immaculately including new game plus like because if you're not if you don't play the new game plus in a devil may cry game at at least in devil may cry 5 i would argue that you haven't really experienced the full game because like you're still unlocking new abilities up until the very conclusion of that game and you don't really have your full move set until the final boss that's cool you can't really like and and you haven't really completed that game until you've kind of mastered it and like getting you know s ranks on the levels and stuff yeah so yeah i don't know i'm just kind of scrolling through my steam library right now and seeing if i can come up with more more points about pacing but really uh, most games that i choose to play i feel like are the right length and proper pacing yeah i I don't know i think i think there's a handful of games personally i feel like there's only a handful of games that really nail pacing like there's small issues here and there for most games that i play like there's a game like Ghost of Tsushima. I love. I think it's a fantastic game. I also think it's too long, you know. Right? Like, but like every now and then comes across. You, you, I come across a game that just from beginning to end is perfectly paced, and it's just it just feels good. I might just be really forgiving because of how upset I was with Subnautica's pacing and like every other game or not pacing but length and uh, every other game. I'm just willing to totally forgive after that game. Yeah, but, I mean. I don't know. Like, I generally find, and I, I don't want to paint a broad br- brush here, for, but like most third-party games I play, like the Ubisoft games and like the EA games, like even I think for as much as I love Mass Effect, the original Mass Effect trilogy, I think it has pacing problems. Yeah, like, I don't play a lot of big. I don't play a lot of bigger games. I guess now that I think about it, like it's pretty rare that I pick up a game that's longer than thirty hours. Yeah, so like, and like well, an Assassin's Creed game, I would probably if I had finished Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I would be sitting here telling you it was too long. I'm almost certain of that, but I just didn't finish it. I walked away. Oh yeah, but like you know, on the smaller games, and I get well, not smaller game, but like indie game perspective, Hollow Knight is like 40 hours, and I loved every second of those. See, you know, there are people that say Hollow Knight was too long. Uh, I disagree with that. Game Maker's Toolkit uh, thought that the entire like you roll the credits the first time you beat the final boss and typically you beat it the original way. And then there's like some more stuff to do to get a different ending and all. And he argued that all of that was superfluous. And I, I disagree, but I also don't think you can grade it on that. Cause it gave you an ending. Like if you wanted, if you thought that yeah. the game was, you know, if you thought that that was good pacing and you were done and you had gotten all that you wanted out of the game, maybe you should have just turned it off, bud. Like, <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I, that, that also falls into the, like, I'm not going to grade you on things I do after the credits roll. Cause like in, in my mind, if you're going to do that, then you haven't completed super Mario odyssey until you collected every moon and get that stuff. And like, yeah, no one's going to do that. that argument was fair. Then yeah, that game was too long. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess what I was getting at is like, I think first parties and indies are better at pacing most of the time than third parties. Just if I'm making a general statement from my and, experience. And these are going to appeal to my tastes because they don't have the budget to make games that are too long for me. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's easier to make a game that 
you know, I, I think it's easier to make a game that goes on for too long than a game that's too short. You know, like one one game that amazed me that I didn't think it was like way too long. Like and one of the longest games I've played recently was Dragon Quest Eleven, And like looking back, that game went on forever. But I do not remember thinking that it was too long while I was playing it. I've, I've heard uh, complaints about Dragon Quest Eleven's pacing, especially like the last third or something. The last I third. The, I could see people complaining about it because it like the final boss appears and you cannot kill it. You are not strong enough and you just kind of have to go around and do stuff until you are strong enough. And uh, I went around and did just about everything, everything that had like voice acting and like, you know, stuff that was like had a story and there was a lot of it to do. There was a lot of story that was not the main story in that game. Like, key moments for a character like one of the characters i don't even think you knew he had a sister and you find out about his sister who got like turned to stone or something and you had to go okay. save her and that's like huge and you do that but like you have to do a ton of stuff like that and even after i'd finished all of that i was not a high enough level and i like had to go grind and i think the reason it didn't bother me that much was because there is a a, a kind of cheaty way to grind in that game where you can level up like you can get to max level in like two or three hours or something and you don't really need to get to max level so i did it for like an hour and then went and fought the final boss and was satisfied yeah and it's like th- there are enemies called metal slimes that appear in that game and uh they give you a ton of xp when you kill them and there's like a, a move you can do that like you can't do all the time, but it's there's like a it, it's sort of like shiny hunting almost. There's a way to make that move appear more often, and it makes a bunch of metal slimes appear, and then you kill them, and then you get a ton of XP, and you just level up really fast. I, I think it's clearly an intentional move by the developers to put that in there so that people who didn't want to grind didn't have to. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's smart because like, but, but you do have to Google it to know that. Like, <laughs> you know, that was not widely available information in the game. So, yeah, and that kind of ties into what I said about those Sony exclusives like God of War and Horizon. Like they have the option for people who just want the story to still have a really, really like well paced game. Yeah. But like if you want to do all the side content, it's still going to be well paced because they accounted for it, you know? Yeah. It's smart game design. Yeah. And, and also, like, I think there is just an hour count where your game is literally too long. And I think Dragon Quest XI was kind of starting to hammer against that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Because over 100 hours in a single-player game is a long time just to yeah, finish the main story. I can't even imagine Persona 5 Royal, right? Like, Because, like, that adds a significant chunk to Persona 5, and I'm just like, how, you know? Yeah, I mean, I- I'm going to look at my playtime right now, but I imagine Dragon Quest Eleven was over 100 hours for me to beat it, and all I did was beat the main story, essentially. Yeah, oh, that's, that's, that's crazy. crazy. I can see my hours in here. Game Pass. Can't win with them. But anyways, do we have any further thoughts on pacing or game length? I think I think it was initially game length conversation. It was initially game length, but pacing is so integral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't really talk about one without you. You can't critique. Oh no, it was only sixty hours for me to beat Dragon Quest Eleven, but that was just the main campaign. That's not that bad. Yeah, that's really. not that bad. Yeah, yeah. You can't really talk about one without the other, in my opinion. So, yeah, agreed. Do we want to get into what we've been playing? Yeah. Um, who wants to go first? I can go first. Uh, okay. Maybe we can combo Connor. Yeah. Yeah. So I think me and Amit are both going to talk about Psychonauts 2. Okay. So I've been highly anticipating. Uh, since it's, since you're new to it, you'll probably explain it better than me. So I'll let you go first. I, I, yeah. I was just going to say, I just want to give a quick preamble. So I think we mentioned in the previous episode that I was playing Psychonauts 1. It felt kind of dated to me. I dropped it after an hour and a half. I was just like, you know, I... I get that this game is going to become amazing once I get through this rough beginning, but like right now, I'm just not feeling it. I watched a recap of the first game on YouTube. I started up the second game uh, on Xbox Series X. I got Game Pass for a dollar for a month, which was sick. And uh, yeah, I uh, very quickly fell in love with this game. So... And I, I think just right away, right, like I was playing the emulated Psychonauts 1 on PS2 
and there's like basically like a second of lag after you hit the jump yeah. button and your character jumps and i was just yeah, like this is just way. yeah just too much but like you know on series x i'm playing at 120 fps buttery smooth 1440p instantaneous response and it just felt so good right off the bat but like characters i found annoying in the first game and i guess just because i hadn't been exposed to them too long like raz like the main character raz oh i God, found annoying. finding raz annoying hurts my soul but here's the thing dude okay uh, on the emulated version i played there were also massive volume issues like the game would be quiet at one moment and then raz would just like scream and shatter my eardrums at the next moment and then yeah, it was just like pick up the pc version of this it was a terrible experience oh, but you know, I went from finding Raz annoying to extremely endearing. Uh, and like the the cast of characters is so well realized. But like that's not even like the main thing. And by the way, Connor, I have not beaten Psychonauts two yet, so we d- I don't want to. I will not spoil it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'm getting close though. Like I'm doing the last uh, Ford crawler level. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, it's like the two thirds mark or something. Maybe. Oh, that's great to hear because I thought it was ending. But um, anyway, yeah, you, got, you got quite a few minds ahead of you. Okay, yeah. The main thing uh, as a newcomer to the series, right, like, the story is interesting and all, like, uh, the whole concept of, like, there's a a spy at the agency and, like, you know, Raz becoming an intern and, like, learning lessons the hard way about, like, not messing with people's minds and stuff like that. But the main thing to me is this game is just one of the most creative games I've ever played. It's It really is. It's... and like the the levels mesh so well with the writing because every level is quite literally a character like yeah because you're inside of someone's mind and so you're learning this character inside and out right so like you so very early on in the game you like mess with someone's mind and you basically give them a gambling addiction right and so when you go inside their mind it's like a massive casino and like the casino is like the level for that for that level and like and, and this it, person is a doctor too, so it, it like it's right. a casino slash hospital and casino like, slash hospital, right? And, and like, I think that that like, trend continues. To live and like things that, like that. And that trend like, continues throughout the game where they combine like two or more concepts, right? Like, uh, like there's a level later on in the game where like, oh gosh, what was it? Like you're at like a music festival, and it's also like, like the five senses, the yeah. five senses. So there's like you know like tongues and noses and like it's it sounds grotesque but it's just like it's just like a it's, it's just a marvel it's just yeah. a marvel of creativity i think did you know that that dude's played by jack black wait no really yeah the sci yeah he's that's played by the sci master is jack black huh yeah i did not know that yeah it, it that like it made the the scene at the end of it so much better for me once i learned that yeah but so so the levels, I think, are definitely the highlight, but the characters are really charming and well-written. Uh, the, the, the overworld is brilliant, I think, right? Like, from what little I played of the first game, it was just the campgrounds. But yeah, like, the overworld's a little lacking in the first game, uh, outside of aesthetics. I think aesthetic, they really did a good job, but it's a little yeah. weird to navigate in the first but game. In this game, like, the hub world is just Psychonauts HQ, and, like, it, that would be fine as a hub world. It's it's very interesting. It has lots of nooks and crannies to explore. But then it just opens up even more, and you can leave the HQ, and there's, like, this whole campground area outside. Yeah, the question area outside the game. is really fun to explore. The questionable area is probably my favorite area in the game. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah but, it's, it's very good. And, uh, yeah, it's just... It, you know, it's funny, like... In 2021, where you'd think that 3D platformers weren't really a force to be reckoned with, this year alone we've had Psychonauts 2, It Takes Two, which I would argue is pretty much as creative as Psychonauts 2, by the way. Do not sleep on It Takes Two. It's very creative. Yeah. And uh, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. I think it's been a fantastic year for uh, mascot platformers and i love to see it you know i think psychonauts 2 is a serious game of the year contender i do want to like uh, my biggest criticism for this game and it's it's something i want to say because it's the same criticism that i throw at the last of us a lot when people say that it's like something that changed gaming is that this is a pretty good 3d platformer that is made amazing by its writing like i think the writing in this game is just immaculate i love I would, every I- character in it 
And like, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think cause, uh, cause no point is the platforming like better than Mario. Like, <laughs> yeah, and it's not a strict platformer either, right? It's more akin to Ratchet and Clank in that sense, where, where like you get abilities and stuff yeah, and like combat powers. Is so much better in the. I mean, it's not great either, yeah. but it's so much better than Psychonauts One, where the combat was really just slapped on. Yeah, the, I, and I agree with you. Like the combat, you know, it's it's serviceable, and that's yeah. fine. But like, I don't care at all. Like, like it's fun to control, like it's and like exactly is good enough that it is not disrupting the game while yeah. also being like an enjoyable experience. And like the way some of the later powers you get actually integrate into combat is really cool. Yeah, um, like I, I I guess uh, some spoilers for Psychonauts too. Um, but you know, when I got the slow down time power and like and it it it's such brilliant it's just so brilliant because like you get attacked like the minute the enemies in this game are like like mental ailments right oh like God, the, the the naming of the enabler enemy had me laughing so hard so you um so so like one of the enemy types that it gets introduced later in the game is a panic attack and, like, before you get the slow down time ability, it's just, like, too powerful. It's, like, really hard to beat. Like, it's really fast and you can't keep up. But once you get the slow down time ability, it's suddenly a lot more manageable. And to me, I feel like it's almost saying that, like, you know, you take, you know, slow things down, take a couple breaths, and you try to, you know, manage your panic attack that way. I don't know. That's just how I took it. But yeah, I agree. I, uh, I also just, uh, both Psychonauts games talk about things like mental illness and, like, also actual, like, and I don't, uh, you know, when you say mental illness, a lot of people just jump straight to depression, but that's not, that's not really Psychonauts take. Psychonauts, like, literally, uh, one of the characters in the first game is schizophrenic, I believe, or at least loosely inspired by schizophrenia, and, like, the, you know, there, there are real mental, like, there are some tough things people are dealing with mentally in Psychonauts 2 as well. And the way Raz handles it in particular, I think, is just really good. Like, there, there is a scene <laughs> where, like, a baby gets flung out of a window, I think, in one of the mines that you're in. And Raz is just like, come on, Raz. It's not real. It's just a mental baby. Because he's yeah. just, like, so gentle with the people's minds that he's in. Yeah, other than, you know. Gentle, yeah. but then there's also combat and all. But, like, when he's interacting with characters in these minds, he's very gentle with them and is, like, trying to help them. And I think the writing there is extremely good. And there's also kind of a through message in this game that, that is stated literally, is that uh, a Psychonaut's job is not to fix someone, it's to help them help themselves. Right. And I just think if you were going to make a game about exploring people's minds and stuff, there's there's some very obvious things you could do that would be not great. And the fact that Psychonauts nails it is really good. Yeah, I've never quite, uh, you know, I've never quite played a game like this before. Yeah, I've played Mascot 3D platformers, but I don't think I've played a game that integrates its themes so well into its design. Like, it's yeah. it's almost scary how well it does this. Like, Yeah, I also just, I, I've heard some people say they didn't love the humor in it. I did. Maybe it just appealed to me because of nostalgia, or maybe I, I, I chuckled a few times at it. Yeah, I was yeah. laughing most of the game. Like, th there's a joke really early on where they—I I won't spoil it, and you know, for people who get to play it because it won't land if I say it. But they're like making a joke about what happens if you die while you're inside somebody's mind, and I actually laughed. Oh really yeah, that was really funny. Long. Yeah, that was really funny. <laughs> and uh, and dude, I, like the 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 cooking show boss fight had me had me cackling. Yeah, it was, just, it was just so absurd, like how they attacked and everything. Yeah, what a fun level! Like I did not expect that dude's mind to be a cooking show. That was yeah, uh, that was wild. God, I'm, I I honestly might just restart this game because I I kind of ruined it for myself because I had to uh I was going out of town and I wanted to beat the game before I went out of town for a week and so I kind of rushed through it. So I okay. So I assumed that I was like about to start the end game because uh, before I started the last Ford Crawler like mind segment, the game said like make sure you do everything before you go yeah. in here, and I was like, oh, okay. You kind of get taken to another place, and things change a little bit. But ah, uh, okay, the game's not over just yet. But yeah, like even the little like side stuff. You said you didn't do any side stuff before beating the game. I did. I tried to do everything. There's I not. I, so I went back and tried to play some of it, and there's not, like, I found Lily, 
uh, Raz's girlfriend, sort of, yeah. who asks you to go find some mushrooms. I found one of the interns who asks you to go find these machines in the questionable area and you like do some combat stuff. Uh-huh. And I got a scavenger hunt. That's the only side stuff I've found. So there's plenty of stuff with your family if you talk to them at the questionable oh, area. Oh, yeah. I forgot. You got to find Quee... Queeby? Is that his name? Queepy or something? Yeah. Queepy. Yeah. That's really fun. Queepy's... Um, I love Raz's family, by the way. Yes. I, I wanted to bring that up. I love the family dynamic. I love the fact that he's like an outcast because he has these powers. And like he has a different relationship with each of his family members. Uh, some more, you know, positive than others because of this fact. And, yeah. like, they're all kind of just chilling in the questionable area, and you can go around and talk to all of them and, like, do the stuff for them. His brother is so funny to me. <laughs> the the skater girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is so funny to me. And he hates psychics and everything. And right, like, yeah. I But okay, that was the only other thing, is that a couple of moments, they utilize the interns really well, in my opinion. But they do seem underdeveloped, underdeveloped from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I went to go do side quests because when I beat the game, they do some stuff that acts like I should really like these other interns and like like they're really good friends of mine and stuff and like we've bonded over time and that did not happen. Like, they felt like a kind of non-factor in my playthrough until the very end and that didn't sit great with me. Yeah, I mean, like, they, they're definitely... Like say, and they're like complete yeah. characters, but you don't like... They don't help you. You don't help them. I was going to say they're very, they're like, they're good characters in the sense that like, they're all like so distinct. Like you, you pick up on their uniqueness right away. Oh yeah. But they don't really have much to do, at least from the part of the game I'm in. No, I mean, they didn't even give every intern a side quest as far as I can tell. Yeah, they didn't. That's, that's kind of a missed opportunity. I feel like, and they just, I don't know. There's like this moment at the beginning where they haze Raz, like they take his clothes and run off. Like, when that happened, I thought it was going to be like a pretty slow win them over type deal. And that's not the case. Like you do one one level and suddenly like all the interns love you and you're like friends. Right. And that's great. Like I, I like that dynamic more than people being, you know, mean to Raz because I, I like Raz too much to watch him get bullied. But yeah, I, I, I love Raz too now, by the way. Like my opinion oh, yeah. of him from the first game does not carry over whatsoever. So. Yeah, he uh, he's good in the first game too. You just didn't get to the parts where he's good, I guess. Yeah. So, okay. So let me tell you, I got to the part in the first game where I was in Sasha nine's mind, which by the way, what a cool name. Yeah. What what a cool character. Sasha nine is awesome. Yeah, he is. Uh, he is really but like he, he, I, he I, I Mia hardly probably. What? Sorry. What was that? He probably didn't even hardly see Mia. Uh, in the but, first game. No. Yeah. So. But, um, yeah, so, like, I got to the part where I basically learned Side Blast, and, like, I was just like, yeah, I don't, I'm not, yeah, you I'm did not, not really this part of the game yet. It, it, yeah. it, it starts a little slow. Yeah, and, it, I, and it I really don't start until you get Levitation. And it, I fully and it, believe that now that I've experienced Psychonauts 2. Like, I know Psychonauts 1 now is an immaculate experience, and I want to go back and experience it. I also kind of just want to hope they remake it. Yeah, that's I, fair. I, I'm honestly, like holding out for hope on a DLC for Psychonauts 2, because I feel like there is uh, like there's, so? there's room to do more in that world. They didn't develop the interns enough. There are people whose minds that I would have liked to have gone into that I didn't get to and stuff. So Yeah, uh, I feel like, I don't know, like I, I hope this game, and I think it was, like a pretty big success, right? Because I know Double Fine was really struggling for a while. Like they had a Kickstarter up for this game. Yeah, for the, long the time. first Psychonauts did not sell well. I mean, that's why. Yeah, it was, it's it's a cult yeah. classic. Yeah, yeah. It didn't sell. I mean, largely it didn't sell well because it was by a really small publisher and released at a time 3D platformers were not really huge. Yeah, it was kind of on the, on the tail end of the 3D platformer craze, right? Yeah, it was. A, yeah, it didn't come out soon enough, and it was also like the first time that Double Fine had, had the budget to really make the games they wanted to make. I think so. Yeah, so this game was like over a decade in the making, right? Like years, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and like Microsoft obviously picked them up, and like they got a lot of their, you know, a lot of their problems sort of disappeared when that yeah, happened. It, it right? shows this game does not show budgetary problems. Oh yeah, it's extremely polished. Yeah. yeah. I didn't run into a single bug, I don't think, playing the game. I didn't, uh, yeah, it, it, it's polished to a mirror shine. Yeah, and that that really just gets me excited, because I feel like we're not going to wait 15 years for Psychonauts 3. I, I'm I, I sure. Because I also, 
My my one major beef with Psychonauts one was that I really liked Lily and Raz's dynamic, and uh, yeah, Lily's kind of in the background in this game. Yep. As, at Lily last. is also yeah. very much in the background of Psychonauts one, and it <laughs> it infuriated me both times. Yeah, she you you like get a couple of really great moments with her, and then you know she is a damsel in distress a little bit in the first game, which is eh, not amazing. Mm. Well, that's, I guess, par for the course for the time period, right? Yeah. Well, she's, yeah, and I think she's probably one of the better damsels in distress because she does a lot to help herself. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, you know, just talking about it, I'm, like, itching to go back and play it. It's just, I've been yeah, so freaking wanna... busy lately. Like, Do I haven't have... been able to play as much as I wanted to. Did you finish the scavenger hunt? I didn't finish it. I've okay. I've found a bunch of this stuff, but I, I haven't I wonder if you actually get to put your old outfit on. Because the, uh, the outfit yeah. change feels really weirdly forced, and I don't even really get why they did it in Psychonauts 2. Like, they, you start the game in the same clothes that yeah. we're at for in Psychonauts 1, because this literally takes place, like, three days yeah. later. Yeah, I think it's just the more of the fact that, like, new game, new outfit, right? <laughs> like, yeah, they really, but it's so weird that they, like, went out of their way to, like, make a story reason you're wearing different clothes, as if people don't just change clothes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. great game, serious game of the year contender for me. Yeah, for me, I think, okay, so game of the year contenders for me right now, Psychonauts 2, Returnal, and It Takes Two, I think are the three I would nominate. Like I those, don't have a great concept of time, so I can't list mine right now. But. Yeah, and you know, it might come as a surprise to some that I didn't put Ratchet and Clank on there. I love Ratchet and Clank. I do not think it's as good as Psychonauts 2. Really? See, I... Well, I've heard some people complain about the platforming in Psychonauts 2 as well. Like, I, I literally heard, I, I listened to the Besties, they did an entire episode on the game, and they said that they didn't think that the platforming in Psychonauts 2 was any better than Psychonauts 1, and I think they are out of their minds. I think that it is very clear that they had people who knew how to make a platformer on this game. I, th- I think the platforming is good. It's not like, blow your mind amazing, but like, I think the main showcase here is just the creativity of the levels. Like. Yeah. That it's alone about exploring these worlds than it is about jumping. <laughs> yeah. But like I don't know, like the the double jump feels good, the glide feels good, the yeah. like the bouncy ball thing feels good. Bouncy like, ball is very good. I so, love rotation in Psychonauts. It's a uh, one of my favorite powers in any game. Yeah, I think it feels extremely good. Yeah. And you know, just no spoilers, right? But like I'm at the point now where I'm missing only I think one psi power and I've I have some predictions on what it is, but I, I don't know. We'll I will see. tell you that they are wrong. Uh, you have not seen any hints as to what the final psi power is. Is it freezing water? No. Okay, never mind. No, they're not going to take away water. That's too critical of a um, yeah. Rez's character, is that he right. can't take water. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited. Kind of is a lot more toothless if you can touch water. Yeah, it's true, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to. I'm sure we'll get the backstory on that, like how his family was cursed to always die in water because we're confronting the one who cursed them. Uh, I'm presuming at the end of the game. So Maligula, yeah, yeah. yeah. You'll. It's very good. It's such a good story, and I can't. I, I'm fighting the urge to talk about it. I uh, yeah. So okay, I'm. I'm. You, you gotta let much... me finish the game because I will want to talk about it. Spoilery. Okay, I'm. I'm. I'm very much looking forward to finishing it. I might just blast through tonight, honestly. Like, yeah, I really want to. Um, <sighs> since we've been ranting and you haven't gotten a word in, Mike, do you want to go next? Uh, I really haven't been playing anything. Okay, I mean, I, I played No Man's Sky, Sky in uh, I played No Man's Sky in VR, and it's oh, an that's so good. I I didn't like the implementation. Really, the I inventory think... management was really bad. You see, in my uh, yeah. Uh, yeah it is <laughs> that's that's my other than that it's just no man's sky so See, i think it's the only implementation of like making a 2d game into vr that isn't terrible every single time i've seen that thus far i've thought it was terrible and pointless like skyrim vr fallout vr i thought those were atrocious and a waste of time and no man's sky vr, VR was actually kind of changed the game yeah other than that i really haven't been playing a lot of interesting games. I finished Control. That's good game. That's in there. <laughs> I, I I haven't been doing much. That's okay. fair. I mean, like I I think last week I didn't really have anything to yeah. mention. It just happens sometimes. I'll jump into Axiom Verge too, though. 
Um, okay. so I'm glad you wanted to talk because I was going to do Psychonauts 2 and Axiom Verge 2. Axiom Verge 2 is a Metroidvania um, sequel to Axiom Verge, if that's not obvious, which I also probably talked about on the show, but uh, Axiom Verge 1 was just kind of... I forget if I played it before or after Hollow Knight, but it was like I needed a Metroidvania to like keep me going, <laughs> if that makes any sense, after Hollow Knight and Axiom Verge was that it's a metroidvania it's okay it's like really high high highbrow sci-fi i guess maybe i don't know if highbrow is fair because i don't want to say that it's like you have to be really smart to understand it because i don't think that's the case it's more like it talks about itself like it's really smart kind of but i don't know if pretentious is the word either i don't know it uses a lot of like sci-fi mumbo jumbo vocabulary and stuff Mm -hmm. Which is fine. It, it did not take away from the game for me. I actually thought the game's story was pretty okay. But uh, the actual like traversal of this game is really fun. You, uh, you play as, like, <laughs> weirdly, the CEO of one of the most massive mega corporations on the planet in, like, the 2050s. And you go to um, an Antarctic research base from another company. And I guess you know their CEO as well and head researcher. And you're like, your daughter went to go work with them or something. And you're looking for your daughter and you end up stumbling into their research facility in the Antarctic and you get in what you think is an elevator, but it's actually a one way door to another dimension. It's an elevator that crosses what's called the breach. Classic. And uh, yeah, and it wasn't originally one way. The elevator's broken. So you're stuck in this other dimension and uh, you very quickly run into this like it's called an arm and it's like a bunch of nanobots in a pot and you get the arm and then you immediately die and the nanobots rebuild you. And then like the narrative from this point is kind of like, who are are you the same person? Like, are you actually still Indra? I think was the woman's name. I don't even remember because it kind of wasn't important, but it's like, are you still this person when you've just been, you know, reconstructed and stuff. And then narrative dives into some of that. And I'm not, if you do not care about that, you will still have a good time in this game, I think. But it's not its not a bad narrative. There's, like, some interesting stuff going on. But what this game does is it kind of has, like, a couple different dimensions that you're bouncing between and stuff as you play through the game. And it, it deals with that really interestingly, kind of in the same... I think the, the closest analog I've seen to it is the Dark World in uh, A Link to the Past, where you yeah. kind of have to enter the Dark World at certain points, but you can exit it whenever you want. You kind of run into that a little bit in this game but really it's just like it's a good metroidvania i i wouldn't really recommend it to people who don't like metroidvanias this is not a game i would jump into as like a first foray into the genre but if you're like if you're a hardcore metroidvania aficionado i think you'd be missing out to not play this game it does some interesting stuff um i think the the smartest thing that this game does is that it realizes its combat is not very fun And it literally just made every single boss in the game optional. You can walk past the boss and you miss out on nothing. Huh. Yeah. But do you you get anything if you beat him? You get um, like skill point upgrades. But these skill point upgrades were common enough that I like never really cared enough to go back and beat the boss because it really just wasn't worth how boring the boss fights were. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the game, I was, you know, I was at, I didn't have a whole lot to do. So I just kind of went and I, uh, stood in place and hit the boss with my axe and they just died eventually. Like I, it was that low stakes. The combat in this okay. game is not great. <laughs> and just kind of, you know, to grab but some extra stuff. The sense of exploration I'm assuming is right. Cause it's very good. Yeah. The sense of exploration is extremely good, which is why I think that this game is still worth recommending because yeah, the com, you know, cause the combat in most Metroidvania games is like not, not what you're there for. It's like so, sort of like what we said in Psychonauts too, where it was there, because it needed to be there. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the combat in this game is pretty terrible, uh, but very ignorable. Like, you can just walk past most of the enemies and stuff, or dodge and stuff. Save points are common enough, and they restore you to full health that you can just kind of tank some damage sometimes. Yeah. But the actual traversal in this game is really fun, and I, uh, yeah, I'd recommend it if you, uh, you know, it's, it's a fair price, I think. It's like eight hours long or so. Yeah, I think... Uh... I have the first Axiom Verge, but I don't think I've really gone into it. This one's a lot better than the first one, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, aesthetically, and uh, also just I, I really in every way, except maybe combat. I actually thought some of the guns were interesting in the first Axiom Verge, I think. 
and there is not a single interesting moment of combat in this game. I cannot stress enough how bad it is. <laughs> but that's okay. Like, like you said, like that's not the main reason most people play Metroidvanias. Right. So yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much all I have to say. Pretty good game. So I have one more game to talk about. Uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. So you're gonna, just, you're gonna talk about Mario Kart 8 Deluxe in September of 2021. Dude, just out of the blue, I got a you know one of my friends texted me. It was like, "Hey, you want to play Mario Kart?" I was like, "Sure." You know, and then all of a sudden, there's like eight of us online playing Mario Kart. Oh my god, like, that sounds almost cool. every day, like after work, like and it's just such a blast. You know, like that game. Oh my god, that game triggers me so hard sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, it's, like. Especially with like eight intelligent, you know, well, by intelligent I mean like non-computer people, yeah. right? Like it's just so chaotic and fun. Like there's been so many moments where like I'm like one inch away from the finish line and I get like red shell, blue shell, green shell, and then I finish like seventh and I'm just raging. Yeah, and it's just so Are you funny. On Discord and stuff too. Actually, no, we're just like you know we're not on Discord. We're just playing online together. But and but like we're in a group text, so we yeah. text each other after each round. And I'm like, oh my god, I hate you so much! Like, <laughs> can't believe you did this to me. So I, it's funny you say that because I have pretty consistently since I got my Switch, or since when, whenever Mario Kart 8 Deluxe came out, which I think was pretty early. Me and my, or maybe even before that, I think we were doing it in the original Mario Kart 8. Me and my roommate in college would just sit down and like have a drink and play. We, we would like whatever the maximum number of races you could do. And we would sit there and we would play every single track in order in Mario Kart 8. Oh like, my God. And we did this like once a week or something. And like, I did this some over the pandemic. Some of my friends would get online and we'd hop on discord and we would just sit down and it doesn't take, you know, it's, it's a couple hours. It doesn't take very long to play every single track in that game. Okay. Yeah. That's just, yeah. So the way we've been playing it, we've been just playing uh, rounds of like four yeah. So like we have like a winner every you know four maps. No, we. Yeah. I mean we were usually drinking, so like, you know. Yeah. But we yeah we would just sit down and we would play every single track because there's not a bad track in that game. You know there are definitely some that are better than others, but there's not a bad track in Mario Kart Eight. Oh, I agree. Yeah, like I think Mario Kart Eight Deluxe is probably the definitive Mario Kart game. Like I, I I've always ha- I've never agreed with people who want to move backwards in Mario Kart. I think every single Mario Kart game has been better than the one before it. You know what? I don't want to disagree with that, honestly. <laughs> like, like there, but, there are Double Dash diehards, but... And yeah, I'm not and Double Dash was like a gimmick. Come on. Wow, that's a hot take. But uh, I, I agree with it, but <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. But anyways, but yeah, I feel like Nintendo has... Uh, it's going to be challenge to top mario kart 8 deluxe though like i disagree there's no way way mario kart 9 comes out with like a hundred maps or whatever yeah like all i want is more tracks like mario kart 8 they could release a dlc for mario kart 8 deluxe tomorrow and i would be really happy about it like oh yeah in fact i think that's what i prefer really because like i think 9 almost certainly will have fewer maps than 8 at launch oh yeah yeah, I mean, yeah, it's because eight has like forty maps or something. Do we think nine will just sort of like bite the bullet and like make it Smash Bros. but kart racing? Because like we've already got like Link and Inkling. Yeah, in this you game. basically have to. Yeah, yeah, do a Nintendo Kart or something. Yeah, I, I, I do want to see Samus driving around the. Uh... Oh my god, does her ship have a name? I can't remember. I don't know, but I, I feel like it has to, right? I think they just called it the gunship in Metroid Prime Three. Now that I think about it, anyway, um, I, I want to see that. I. uh... We already have Villager and Link, like you said. Yeah, and I Ingram. forgot about a game. What? I forgot about a game I played, and by played, I mean I opened it up and was immediately daunted. What is it? Uh, what was it called? Aurora 4X. It's ah, familiar. It's it had- what happens when you give one man, you tell a guy enough times to just make the game of his dreams, and so he does. <laughs> And it's the equivalent of opening up a spreadsheet on Microsoft Excel. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> oh, really? it's it's super deep, but it's it makes Door Fortress UI look like like triple A tier. <laughs> you are not selling this game very well. <laughs> oh, I'm selling it to the right kind of people. It's one of those <laughs> games you just open up and you're like, oh dear. I mean, you had me when you said 4X, but now I'm kind of questioning everything. I, I mean, I, I got to put time into learning it, but 
it doesn't do itself any favors. <laughs> it's it's super complex, and I don't understand it, but I just think it deserves mention as one of those weird games that's out there. That's fair, yeah. It's but always hey, you know you can always you can always trust Mike to come in with the deep cuts. Yeah, you, know? you can. Yeah, you know I'm like the most generic, boring guy you, when it comes to video games. Mario Kart. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, and my Connor is a little more out there, right? He plays some more like indie indie things, but like Mike's the one that's like, "Hey, this game that three people have played, check this out." <laughs> there's there's a, there's a community about Aurora Forex. Like, I had to find it out about it from somewhere. It didn't just pop out of nowhere. Yeah. Oh yeah. I want to <laughs> dunk on something. I knew I couldn't tell if Mike was done yet, but uh, this game missed. <laughs> they made a VR port of Mist. For the Oculus Quest, like last year, I think. And they ported it to PC and Xbox and added it to Game Pass. And I was really excited to play it. And everybody was saying online, the VR port of Mist is coming to Xbox Game Pass for PC. And I was really excited. And I fired it up. And they took the VR out of the Game Pass version, but not out of the Steam version. And I've never been angrier at a developer in my life. That's hilarious. Microsoft hates VR. Holy crap. No, they don't. No, they do not. Because there are lots of VR games on Game Pass. <laughs> like, they exist. So this developer, like, I looked it up. They said they were having some technical issues and that they could not put the VR version on Game Pass as well as the 2D version. And I know mm-hmm. for a fact that is not true because No Man's Sky did it. And... um a uh, lot of other games did. Flight Simulator did it. Like lots of ga- there are lots of VR games on Game Pass, and I'm just really mad about it because I really want to play the VR version of that game, and I cannot do it. Yeah, so uh, I'm assuming Game Pass for PC, right? Because there's no VR on right. Console. This is Game Pass for PC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's also only... a Game Pass for console. Like they made a 2D port of this game, mm-hmm. but the fact that they made a VR game, ported it to 2D, and then only gave me the 2D version infuriates me i am so upset about that i can't believe now we're getting bad ports on the same platform yeah this makes no sense didn't we get over bad ports i'm not gonna necessarily say it's a bad port because i did not really give it a fair shake but i was so so angry that they did not give me the right version of this game. Anyway, that's that's all I have. I just wanted to throw some shade real quick at the end of the podcast. <laughs> and, adding on to that, wasn't there wasn't there a game recently that the Xbox Game Pass version was the better port? Yes, I believe you were thinking of. Um, oh, I played replicant, it, wasn't it? Uh, it was a uh, near Automata, maybe. I, it I might mean, have been near Replicant. I don't think that's too surprising, though, right? Like generally, games. It, that come out on PC and console. I feel like console is better optimized, right? Mm, no, we're talking about the depends. PC Xbox yeah. Game Pass for PC version. Yeah, this is this oh, is the same okay. platform. So they yeah they released it on Steam and it was a bad port. And then a couple years later, they put it on Game Pass, and the version on Game Pass was not the same version on Steam, and it had fixes that were not on Steam. Got a better port on the same platform. Yeah, it's near Automata, uh, become as God's edition, and that was is never that, that was never available on Steam. I don't think. And it, is that it even a port at this point, or is it just a re-release? I don't know because it, it's definitely it has patches that the PC like it has HDR support. I'm seeing that right now, and I know for certain the original near Automata did not have PC or uh, HDR support. So. Can we can we start calling it a port as we put it as they put it on different stores? Well, so so what they did was they took Nier Automata, which did not originally come to Xbox, they ported it to Xbox One and added some new stuff, and then they backported that back to PC for uh, for Game Pass. Oh, no. Yeah, th- that's the story with Nier, I'm pretty sure, which is just insane. But I played the original Nier Automata release on PC. It wasn't great, but it was very playable. I liked that game, so I don't know. Maybe I got lucky and happened to have the right configuration of hardware that the game ran well, but... I wasn't complaining. You done, Connor? I am done. That was Mike. That wasn't me. <laughs> Both of us. Don't don't shift the blame on me. <laughs> Just stick that bad juju in my direction. <laughs> All right. I think that's going to do it for Game Talk this week. Thank you guys for listening. You can follow us at Ad Podcast Game Talk on Twitter. Please like, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, any podcast service you use. Click the link in the description of this video to join our Discord and talk to us there. Thank you, Connor and Mike. Yeah, see you guys next week. See you next week.
You know, it's funny, you know, uh, last week we didn't have any shtick, so I actually went to the episode before, so like two weeks ago, because we had comments on, like, Star Citizen. Yeah. And I stuck that at the end, so. The things I do for this podcast, guys. Yeah, I know. You're pretty committed. You're a lot more committed than me and Mike. <laughs> I'm, so, You know, I'm reeling over the fact that, Connor, you insinuated that. I put about as much effort into this podcast as you do. What do you mean? I put less effort than you do. I barely put any effort into oh, my own okay. podcast. I thought you were suggesting uh, that I didn't put any effort no, in. You put, you put like an iota more than I do. Yeah. Uh, I barely are you, put effort into my own podcast. Of your own podcast? Yeah, I have Drunk Movie Night. 